If you are a fresher into IT, upscaling or shifting your career into IT, you need to know TCP IP. So what is TCP IP? What's an IP address? What's the difference between IPv4 and IPv6? What's a subnet? What's a network? What's a host? What is TCP IP routing to start with? These and more are going to be covered in this video. By the end of the video, you will know exactly what's an IP address, why do we need it, why do we use it, how to use it, and be ready for your cloud DevOps and more career options that you'd like to pursue. All right, so let's start. And let's now introduce something called the binary numbering system. We are all used to the decimal numbering system. 10 plus 10 is 20, 10 plus 5 is 15, 2 times 3 is 6. I mean, we, we deal with that day in, day out. So why do we need to learn another number system? IP addressing is related to it. Second thing is because everything inside our phones, computers, iPads, and laptops, and so on, it's all binary. It's all digital and it's all binary. And the binary numbering system, unlike the decimal numbering system, it has only two symbols, the zero and the one. In the decimal numbering system, we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These are the symbols that are used to build any decimal number or any integer, basically. We're not talking about dot something or dot five or point five or I'm talking about decimal numbering system as a whole. So computer systems and digital devices, they all use the binary numbering system in between or inside them. And when we use decimal numbering system in our application, so you are using a calculator on your laptop and you type 15 times five, guess what? Inside the laptop, this is going to be converted into the binary equivalent of 15, binary equivalent of five, and then a digital operation is going to happen to multiply them and get you the result. So you enter the numbers are decimal and the result is going to come out as decimal as well. For example, if we have the number 204, the binary equivalent is going to be 11001100. Don't worry about, about that. If you have any calculator or even on the internet, just write down what's the binary equivalent of 204 and you will find this is the equivalent, the string of ones and zeros on the screen. Each one of these ones and zeros is called a bit, a binary digit. Okay, so this string has eight bits. Eight bits are equal to one byte, or we call it an octet. Let's recap our web application, the client server that we talked about, and find out if I am on the internet using a digital device, a mobile phone, a laptop, a desktop, whatever it is. And then there is dolphinet.com. When you open your Chrome and then, or Safari or whatever, and then you type www.dolphinet.com, magic happens. You don't see it, you don't know what happened, but you are going through the internet and you get the page of dolphinet.com. How did that happen? How did my request to open www.dolphinet.com get to the right IP address on the server or the right location of the server? And how did the response from the server make it through the internet to me and it did not mistake me to someone else? How did that happen? And that's because of what we call the IP addresses. So the IP addresses is my address on the internet and your address on the internet. Exactly like if you have a mailing address and I have a mailing address, we can write letters and send them to, to one another. Or maybe you can send me a gift and I can send you a thank you letter. Also on the email side, you have an email address. I have an email address. You write the email address. So you become the sender. I am the receiver. It gets to me. Now I type the response and I click on send or submit. And that brings that back to you. So two things happen. You have to have an IP address or your machine or your client or your phone has to have an, an IP address on the internet. And also the server has to have an IP address on the, on the internet and they must be reachable IP addresses. Reachable in the sense that they are accessible from the internet. That's what reachability here means. But who does the actual routing? Who takes it from your laptop or mobile phone or iPad and then forward it until it gets? So you are in the US talking to someone or a server in Japan and who gets it all the way to Japan and brings it back? That's what we call 
the IP routing which is enabled on the internet. So the internet is nothing more than a lot of devices interconnected at high speed and these are called routers. These are actually giant routers that are responsible for forwarding all the traffic that happens second by second on the internet. So IP address on the server and the client and we need IP routing. That's, that's the whole magic that happens. And of course you need the Chrome or the Safari browser. And on the other side, we need a web engine. It could be an Nginx, it could be an Apache, it could be an equivalent one something that can build a website and listen to the request and then build the responses and send them back. Okay, so IP addresses are needed because these are the addresses. This is how you are known to on the internet. And that's why we need an IP address and every device on the internet has an IP address. So what if I'm connected to 5G or 4G network, I'm on the go and I have my phone, data is activated and I have access to the internet. Does the phone have an IP address? And the answer is yes. I'm connected with my iPad at home to the Wi-Fi and I'm connected to the internet. How does that happen? Again, you have an IP address on your device. So there is nothing happening on the internet or on any infrastructure enabled for TCP IP forwarding and transmission without IP addresses. TCP IP stands for Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol, TCP IP. Okay, so your IP address is like your business address or your home address, and that's how people can deliver packages to you, okay? And exactly like we do with human beings, that everyone has an IP address with a city and street number and an apartment number if it is a building, and then the state and the country, same, whatever it is, then we do the same thing when we are talking about clients trying to speak to a server or servers trying to speak to a server. Everyone has an IP address and that's how they communicate. IP addresses, they could be public, they could be on the internet, accessible through the internet. And as we will learn later on, we have private IP addresses, the ones that we can deploy inside a building without being exposed to the internet, or we need a converter in order to have them reach the internet. There are two major types of IP addresses, and that they are the IPv4 and the IPv6. The IPv4 is the one we are using mostly now on the internet, and it has been in the use for about 30, 40 years now. And it's in decimal notation. It's 32 bits long. Remember, what's the bit? It's a binary digit, the one or a zero. So 32 bits long. And as we mentioned, a string of eight bits constitutes what we call an octet or a byte. So the IP address is four bytes or four octets long or 32 bits long, they are the same. And an example is 120.1, an example would be 120.130.233.12. So this is a string of eight bits, a string of eight bits, a string of eight bits, and a string of eight bits, okay? In the binary notation. And the number here in any one of these octets cannot exceed 255 and cannot be less than zero. And it requires something we call a subnet mask. We'll learn why. And it can be public or private IP address. On the other side, when they were worried that the IPv4 is going to be depleted, IPv4 addresses are scarce already and there isn't plenty available. And there aren't plenty out there to be enough for everything happening on the internet. So that's why they came up with IPv6. And it's not in decimal, it's in hexadecimal notation. Another numbering system. And it is 128 bits long, four times longer than this one. And it has eight fields. Each one of them is 16 digits or two octets. Here it's only four fields. Each one is one octet. Here we have eight fields and each one of them is two octets. And here's an example. And as you can see, it's much more complicated compared to the IPv4. And it requires also a subnet mask, but it's all public. There is no private IPv6 addresses. Why there isn't an IPv5? Ask the ones who came up with the names, the scientists who worked on that, and they will tell you why. I don't know why. Okay, so now if we revisit our client and web server, then we have a server with an IP address and a client with an IP address. And as if we have two with the name George in the same room 
And if someone comes in and says George, both of them are going to look at the person or maybe both of them are going to respond. And the same, same analogy happens on the internet. If we had the same IP address available on two servers, then which one would respond? That's why there are no overlapping, there is no repetition of public IP addresses on the internet. So there is no way there will be someone using the same IP address as the other one, unless he, if it is a hacker trying to pretend to be someone, but then the routers on the internet are going to be intelligent enough and they should stop it. So how can we regulate that? How can we govern that and control it? There are something or entities called internet registries, and these are the, these are the ones appointed in each continent to hold the range of IP addresses or be the representatives of the ones who hold the available ranges or the available space of the IPv4 address. And you have to submit a request. You have to send a justification. Why do you need the public IP address range? And then they will decide to give you eight or 16 or 32 or 256 or more or less. All right. So it's all governed and everyone should, should have a unique a public IP address on the internet to be accessible through the internet. And then of course we have the IP routing that we are going to cover later on. Okay, and if you are on a Windows machine, you can use from the command prompt ipconfig to find out what the configuration is or what's the IP address. Or if you are on Mac or Linux, you can do ipconfig get interface address ethernet0 or en0 and you should find your IP address. Okay, now let's find out if we have a building and I'm sending a letter into that building, 32 St. George Street, Toronto, Canada, for example, and the postal code. Now, if it gets to the building, 32, that's a high rise. It has like 40 stories and maybe 200 apartments. Then which one should get it? Who should get that? That means the IP address that you have, if we take that analogy and then draw it to the IP addressing, if I have a network with multiple servers, then I should be able to address a server on that network. It cannot be that I'm going to send to all of them. And that's exactly the case. Every IP address has what we call a network part and a node or a host part. So let's take the one on the screen as an example. We have 192.168.1.2 and then with any IP address, there is a slash and then a number. This number can be anywhere from two or from one even to 32. It cannot exceed that. Why? Because that number signifies the following. That number can allow any device or any machine or any server or any router to find out where is the network part and where is the host part. Remember when we said that any IP address is 32 bits long, 8, 8, 8, 8. Each one of these fields is 8 bits. When you have a slash 24, what does it mean or what does it signify? It signifies from the left hand side, count 24 bits so that's one octet that's eight eight and eight so that means the first three fields on the left hand side this is the network part and the remaining which is the eight in this case is going to be the host part so here that this is the network and that's a host on the network that's an apartment in the building that's a house in the street so the street is one thing and then which is the network and then each house has a number in that street or has a host in that street or a node in that street. So what can tell the computers and the networking devices and all that, what is the IP address of the node and what's the network that it belongs to? That's the subnet mask. And the length, as we mentioned, it can be eight, it can be nine, 10 and so on. So anywhere between one and 32. And the binary equivalent of this number is this string here and this is 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits. The one in white, this is the network. And then this is the host in, the, in, the, in this case. So if it is 3, then this is going to be different. If it is 4, then this is going to be different. So the same network can have multiple hosts or multiple nodes into it. Okay, what if the number is different? I mean, it's 192.168.1.2 slash 16. If it is slash 16, this means that the network is 8 and 8. So that's the left two fields. And then the right two fields are going to be the node or the host. And the subnet mask is the judge. It's the one that decides which one is the network and which one is the host. Okay, and here's the equivalent and the network part and the host part. 
Now let's get into the subnet, something called subnetting. And in order to understand subnetting, we have to understand something called CIDR or CIDR, the classless interdomain routing, and that's a CIDR range, a block of IP addresses. And examples are 10.0.0.0 slash 8. What does the slash 8 mean? The first field is the network and anything that goes here is the host. Slash 24, the first three, 888, are the network part. And then we have the host part. So the host part can be 0, 1, 2, all the way to 255. That's the maximum. And then we have 120.100.0.0 slash 16. What's a slash 16 signify? It signifies that the first field and the second field is the network. And then the two others are the hosts. Okay. So what's the notion or the meaning of subnetting? Subnetting means I have a block, a, whole, a big network, and I need to splice that into multiple networks. So I have an orange that I want to equally divide into four quarters. And usually the subnetting, when you have a range and you want to divide it, you can divide it into two or four or eight or, or 16 or 32. Can I divide it into five equal parts? No, you cannot. But you can divide it into eight, use five, and then three will be spare or backup. Okay, I need 12. Can I do 12? No, you cannot. You can do 16 equal parts and then you use 12 of them and then you have four spare. That's how it works with the subnetting. It has to be divided into the multiples of two. Two, four, eight, 16, 32, uh, 64, 128, 256 and so on, okay? And here we have an example, 10.0.0.0 slash eight. I want to divide it into two equal ranges. What do I do? That means I need to increase the subnet mask from eight to nine and that will give me two different fields. How can I get that? Easy, I mean, we can do the math, but that will take us a long time to learn, but we can do the online subnet calculators, which are going to help us do that and achieve that as well. So let's go ahead and do some exercises about this and find out how it looks like, what will be the equivalent ranges, and what would be resulting subnets or the resulting equal parts that we are going to have. Okay, so here is an IP address range or a CIDR block 192.168.240.0 slash 24. Now we are the experts. Slash 24 means 24 bits from the left hand side is the network part and then whatever is left is the host part. So the 192.168.240 is the network part and then this is the host part. What is required? The required is to split this orange CIDR block into four equal pieces. As we mentioned before, if we put all the values of the hosts here, the minimum is zero and the maximum is 255. So that is a complete 256 different combination in the host part. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 20, 21, 22, 100, 200, 254, 255. So if you count these, including zero, these are 256 different numbers. So if I want to equally divide that, use your calculators, please. 256 by 4 is 64. So the resulting is going to look like that. It's going to be from 0 to 63, these are going to be the first 64 numbers. And then from 64 to 127 is going to be the second, the third equal part, and the fourth equal part. Of course, the numbers are different, but they are 64 in each one of these. And that was the requirement. And as we mentioned earlier, we can divide by 2, we can divide it by 4, by 8, by 16, but we cannot divide it by 6. We cannot divide it by 3 or by 5. And the subnet for each one of these is going to look like this. So the resulting quarter of the orange of the cider block is going to be, the first one is going to be 192.168.240.0. The second one is going to be 192.168.240.64. And the third one is going to be .128. And the fourth one is going to be 192. So the network part did not change in all of them. However, now I have four distinct subnets that has, a, each one of them has a start and an end and there are only 64 hosts in each one of them. So as if I had an apartment of four bedroom and then I divided this four bedroom and I had an external door to each one of them and I blocked the common doors and now they are completely separate. That's exactly what we did here. And the subnet mask is going to be a slash 26. Why? Because if you want to divide by two, the subnet mask of the resulting uh, halves is going to be slash 25. If you want it from your original subnet mask to divide by four, 
So that means the subnet mask is going to be a slash 26. Or that means you have taken two bits to divide and this two zero one zero 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 one zero one one or these are the different combinations so that gives me four how about if i wanted to divide by eight then you take the subnet mask and you increase it by three how about if it was 16 then you increase it by four so it becomes 28 and so on okay to prove that let's take the same range and we are going to go into this website and let's play a little bit and see if what we did is right or wrong so if you click on that page, you get into here. And then here we are going to put the IP address as 192.168.240.0. The initial subnet mask was what? Exactly. The initial subnet mask was slash 24. So what I will do now, so slash 24, I want to make it into a slash 26. Why do you want to do it into a slash 26? Because I said, if I want to divide by four, I have to increase the subnet mask by two. So let's calculate and let's find out what will be, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't like the subnet mask here. That's fine. So let's calculate now and here we go. So here is the IP address, okay? And here's the first range. So it starts, the subnet starts from zero and then dot one, dot 62 dot 63 so these are the available ranges forget about what the broadcast is now because we don't want to talk about it right now it's not relevant total number of hosts or nodes in that subnet is going to be 64 and the subnet mask is going to be slash 62 and then we have the other two the other three 64 128 192 and it gives me that this one starts at 64, so that's 65 and all the way to 126. And then I have 127 as what we call a broadcast address and so on. So here they are saying all four of the possible slash 26 networks for 192.168.240 are these ones. What if I wanted a slash 25? How many, how many parts am I going to get? So we shifted the subnet mask, we increased it only by one. And that, believe it or not, is going to give me only two halves and these are the two halves how about if the range was different let's say it was 10.0.0.0 and the original subnet mask was slash eight and now i want to divide it into eight eight equal parts what do i do so that means i need to take the slash eight and increase it into 11. why because we said we have to increase the subnet mask by three if you wanted eight parts and here we go one two three four five six seven eight so this is your guide your helper if you want to go and calculate the subnet masks there is a lot of math behind it you don't need to waste your time on that but now you understand if you are given a cider block a range or a block of ip addresses you can be smart and you can divide it. why would i divide it because it's not advisable to have two thousand or 200,000 nodes on the same network. So what we do is we divide them into a smaller subnets or networks, and then we divide our host so we can also have an application segment and we can have a database segment and we can have a web segment and we can have a secure segment, and then we can apply devices in between to connect them. And these devices or network devices are going to apply security and ensure who is talking to whom. If one segment is compromised, not necessarily the other ones are going to be compromised, but if they are all on what we call a flat network, they are all nodes or hosts on the same network, then if one system is compromised, the others can be compromised as well. All right. And also, if we didn't have that, imagine how many million devices or maybe billion devices are on the Internet today. Imagine if they were all sending their traffic on the same network and any one of us can try to hack any other one because there is no security, no isolation, nothing between us. And that would have been so risky and the, net, the internet on, or the traffic on that network would have been humongous to a point where maybe all of us would have suffered even to communicate. All right, so segregating and distributing that into separate uh, smaller networks across the globe is how the internet is still functioning properly right now and also how we can isolate and protect
the different segments from one another and from the external sources or even maybe from the internal sources all right so that's something that we need to know by heart and this calculator should be your best friend there are different classes of ip addresses and this is just for your knowledge so if the leftmost octet starts with one or up to 126 this is called class a and the common subnet mask in class a is slash eight so we have more hosts than networks in a, in a class a ip address if the leftmost octet is 128 or 129 or 130 all the way between 128 to 191 inclusive then that's a class b and the common subnet or the starting subnet would be a slash 16 and it's balanced between the number of hosts and the number of available networks and then a class c which is when the leftmost starts with 192 and goes all the way to 223 and the common subnet mask or the starting subnet mask is slash 24 it has less host on each network it has so many networks okay so this is just for your knowledge you're not going to be asked about this in an aws exam a project but maybe in an interview especially if it is a junior job and i want to they want to validate your networking skills okay now here is a table that tells you if you want to divide your range by two then you just increase by one they increase the subnet mask value by one so if it is slash 24 we make it 25 that's the subnet mask how many subnets are going to be resulting it's dividing by two so that's two halves and then it shows me if we are starting with a slash 24 so that there will be um, seven bits left for the host or in other words each one of the two halves can have up to 128 ip addresses if you want to divide by four so then we increase it by two the subnet mask becomes slash 26 and then the number of resulting subnets are four equal ones and the number of hosts in each is 64 and so on so this is like a guiding table if you want to use and of course it applies if i start the slash eight and I want to divide by two, so I'm going to increase by one, so that becomes a slash nine. If I want to divide by four, so that will become a slash 10, and this, this is going to be the subnet mask. So the starting subnet mask length, increase one, that means dividing by two. Increase two, that means dividing by four, and so on. Okay, now let's talk about public IP addresses. And we said public or internet routable IP addresses. That means they are assigned by internet registries. You cannot just deliberately use any one of them. And if they are private, there are private ranges that anyone can use, but don't send them on the internet because they will not be routable and the internet routers are going to drop the traffic sourced from private IP addresses. You can use them without any permission from anyone in your network, in your enterprise, and all our Wi-Fi devices at home believe it or not they will be using the 192.168 range because it's a private one and that's how the ip addresses inside your home are going to be from this range okay i can use the 172.16 all the way so i i can use 172.17 18 all the way to 31 and i can use the 10.0.0 slash 8 without any permission from anyone okay And here are a set of quick subnets that you can use deliberately without even going and asking permission from anyone. And this can be applied also on AWS. But now you also have the, cal the subnet calculator. So if you are given a range and you want to divide it into 4, into 8, into 16, into 32, then you can do that. Or these are ready-made ones that you can use them um, and, and go ahead and work with them. If you wanted a fourth one, that will be dot four, dot five, dot six, and so on. So in practice, in real life, if I'm doing this, how would I design it? How um, am I going to go with a slash 28 or a slash 15 or a slash 24? What do I do? Usually in, in real life, you would ask the question, how many segments do we have? They will tell you this is application X, application Y, database one, database two, and this is for demilitarized zone, and this is for connectivity to the other sites, and this is for the uh, branches and all that. So you will gather all that information, and then you ask them, okay, in that building, you needed one subnet. How many users are going to be in that building? If they said 2,000, 3,000, say, no, 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 that's wrong. It cannot be one subnet. It has to be divided. You can have 128 maybe, you can have 256, but not more than that. And the, the lesser, the better. 
Now they tell you, okay, fine, we're going to go with 250 users in each subnet. And then you say, okay, I know that I'm going to go with a slash 24 and that will give me 255 as Isa told me, and that should be enough. And the answer is you're wrong. Because if you do that, and then they hire 20 more employees in that subnet or in that department, what are you going to do? Are you going to reconfigure your infrastructure again? So when you do the, the practice, if they told you we need 250, make each subnet a 512. What would be the 512? That's a slash 23 subnet. Make the, do the math or go on the internet calculator and you'll find that. So you usually leave some spare, some space to grow, to scale. That's very important. If they told me we need 30 subnets, Okay, that's the maximum we are going to use on day one. I say, okay, fine. I'm going to divide that into 64, use 30, and you'll have 34 more for growth. Or maybe I'll divide it by 128. You use 25 of your capacity in day one, and then you can grow three times that in the next five, 10, 15 years or something. So always plan for the future and don't limit yourself to what is required because re-addressing an infrastructure is a nightmare. Now let's look at what we call routing and switching. We mentioned on the internet between the client and the server, there are two things. There is the IP addresses and also there is the IP routing. So let's learn at a high level what that is. Let's first start with the LAN local area network. What's the local area network? That means connecting multiple devices in a data center. It could be application and database and they want to connect in the data center because the users will come from the internet and get into the website and from there they are going to get into the applications and database and all that. So building or connecting devices to communicate with one another in a confined area and that could be one building, it can be one room, or it can be a campus in a confined area. So it could be a university campus, for example. This is called a local area network. And local area networks requires what we call switches to connect them. So you hook them with cables, and they could be fiber optic cable, or they could be copper cables, depending on the speed you need and the distance, and you end up with a network. And you could have in your home that you have the wireless, the Wi-Fi router, and then you are connecting a device wired, and then you have Wi-Fi devices also connected. So, so every home router has a mini switch. So that means connecting devices in a closer proximity to each other, and that's what makes the local area network. And the Wi-Fi routers will have a mini switch, as we mentioned as well. And these could be smaller ones like the one we have at home, or they could be the giant ones used in data centers. Okay, what if we have multiple buildings? Then what we do is we connect switches, and then we link those switches with what we call an uplink. So a link that is going to another building or to another entity. And that could be how we do it in a data center. So that's completely high level. 101 introduction to uh, switching or local area networks. Mo now I have the data center and I need people to connect from the internet to the data center. What will be the first device in my infrastructure that connects to the internet? Can it be a switch? Usually it is a routing device, a device that understands IP addresses and can make decisions based on that. And they establish databases of destinations they can reach on the same device. Can a device be a switch and a router at the same time? Of course, they can be. So if I need to connect a site to another site, we need a router on each side. Okay, so on each one of these, the gateway, the way out to the internet, or if there's a private connectivity between them, then it's going to be a routing device on this side and a routing device on this side. There's going to be a network and hosts in that network, or maybe multiple networks on this side, and also maybe one or more networks with hosts configured and active in them on this side as well. Can the IP address or the range of the network on this side and on this side be the same? Of course not. Imagine that you are writing a letter and you are saying the sender is, and you put your details, and then you put the receiver is and you put your details and you go to the post office and you drop it in the mailbox. Imagine where it will go. It will come back to you, right? So if you want to send it to a receiver, you have to have the sender and receiver be different. 
So these devices to communicate with the devices on the other side, they have to sit on different networks. They have to be different hosts on different networks. Now, can this be a host of value one and a host of value one, but on different networks? It is 10.0.0 slash 24. Slash 24 means the first three octets are the network and this is the host. So if the networks are different, the host can repeat. But if, if we have the same network here and the same network here, guess what? The router will never send it to the other side because each time the, the message will arrive at the router, the router will look at where is it going and you will find out this is going to a device on my network. Why should I send it out? I'm going to just resend it back. So the message will never get delivered. So in order for routers to function properly, they should be sitting on different networks. And that's another good reason why we have subnetting, because if you have a big block and now I need to build a hub and spoke, like a central location where the branches are going to connect to, that means an IP address range is required in each one of the branches, but also another one is required also at the main or the headquarters. All right. So that's just tying everything together so a routing device is required what about the one i have at home is that an internet router yes it is an internet router it gives you private ip addresses on the wi-fi and then it connects to the internet with a public ip address and it does translation as well okay so that's an intelligent many device basically now if we elaborate on the same example we had so i have a server with 10.0.1.5 slash 24 on this side the network on this side is 10.0.1.0 slash 24. So that's the network. And these are the hosts. Any number here is the, are, are the hosts. And I have a router that has an IP address of dot 15. So even the, IP, the router is considered to be a node or a host on this network. That's how it talks to this network. And then on the other side, I have a completely different CIDR block. Uh, I have 192.168.1 slash 24 as well. So the three octets are the network and then this is the host. And then I have the router dot one dot one. And then I have a server here, which is dot one dot 13. Okay. Now, what would be the database look like on this router? And what would the database look like on this route? What is this? This is called the routing table or the forwarding database on the router. So this router will know about 10.0.1.0. And this is through its local area network interface, through, through the interface connected to the switch. And the router on the other side, it will know also through the local area network about 192.168.1, which is connected here. But then they will exchange the information that each one has. So this router, router B, will know about 192.168.1.0, which is the other side, and it will know about it from router A. And router A is going to know about 10.0.1.0 slash 24, which it also knows about it from router B. So that means the routers can exchange the forwarding information and that's how they know about the remote networks and not only the local ones. That's how it works. Now one might ask, okay, how about the network in between, the one that is on the internet or maybe the private connectivity. It must be an IP enabled network as well, and they must have an IP address on each side of this network. And that's how they communicate. So end to end, there is IP processing and IP intelligence across the board. And using these routing tables, routers can make forwarding decisions and they can send it to the next router on the path until it gets to the destination. That's how the internet even works today. So there is a database always, and this database can be built statically or manually, or it can be using dynamic routing protocols. So basically enable a forwarding protocol here and a forwarding protocol here, and they will exchange the information in the sense of routing updates. On the internet, the most famous one is called Border Gateway Protocol or BGP. This is the most famous one that has been used on the internet for decades right now, successfully without any issues. And we don't know anything about that. We are just using the internet and we have no clue what's going, uh, going on under the hood, basically. Okay, so the internet is nothing more than a number of, or a huge number of routers that are interconnected with high speed connections. And a user sitting in the US could be talking to a web server in India and we don't, it happens in a fraction of a second if we have good internet connection. Okay. And as you mentioned, there are 
uh, devices that can do both. They can do routing and switching. And an example is the Wi-Fi router we have at home. I hope by now the course was beneficial and you do understand what's a subnet, what's a subnet mask, what's an IP address, why do we need it and how to use it and what's local um, area networks and switching and routing and so on. Now you are good to go and start your next steps into cloud DevOps and so forth that requires this as a beginner. If you haven't subscribed, please do so right now. Give us a like, support us and share if you will. And also browse www.dolphinet.com for more courses that have to do with cloud, AWS, Azure and DevOps, Kubernetes, Docker and so on. The link is on the screen right now. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next video.